Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 543, a special episode. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Father Argo, and today is October 17th, 2019. Okay, for those of you who have not watched us for the last half hour, we've been having some technical difficulties. In the world of uh, frontline operations in the kingdom, we were having spiritual warfare. We basically had to try a a whole bunch of different things to get this communication between uh, Connecticut and Texas to work. We're up and running. I have Father Argo, but before we get too far into the program, I need you guys to like this to share this with your friends, to subscribe if you're not subscribed, and to keep the conversation going in the comments. If you know who Father Argo is, even though his his face is now masked, don't tell anybody. Uh, He works in the front lines of uh, the kingdom, and we do not need his identity revealed uh, so that foreign powers can get a hold of him. Uh, He's been able to stay one step ahead for a long time, and this program aims to keep it that way. Father Argo is on this program because where he operates uh, in Syria, uh, Iran, Iraq, the Middle East, uh, things have changed a lot in the last uh, two weeks. Uh, President Trump has decided that uh, troops are no longer needed in the area, that promises made by previous administrations will not be honored, and he's pulling out, which has left what we've seen before a vacuum, a power vacuum. And where there's a vacuum, it will be filled. And we're seeing this in Syria. We're seeing Turkey uh, move with the help of Russia into Syria. And there are vulnerable people in Syria, uh, the Kurds, Christians, uh, Muslim converts, Muslims themselves, who are going to be victims of you know this coming atrocity. Uh, they're being killed now. They're in the way. They're on the front lines. And I have Father Argo here to talk about what's happening on the ground now and what we can do uh, as Christians to help. Uh, first, uh, Father Argo, welcome back to the program. Uh, give us a little geopolitical understanding of the Middle East. I mentioned the power vacuum we saw when uh, Saddam Hussein was killed uh, um, by our, our American government. Boom! power vacuum that what do we do now the he was a tyrant he was horrible but he kept the peace for everybody living in iraq um and we're now we're going to see this power vacuum where america steps out explain what's going to happen yeah in 30 seconds explain the middle east right <laughs> yeah you got all day i, I got the record i go for it <laughs> yeah. well yeah i mean you, you you've nailed it iraq is um very, very fragile itself since the U.S. intervention. So you have now a, a Shia majority ruling a Sunni minority. Um, part of that is what, what created ISIS. So we have the, the Sunni over in the west and the northwest. And um, they're not uh, you know, going to tolerate Shia rule out of Iran. The thing to know is that the U.S. won the war and gave just gave Iraq essentially to Iran. So the, the reason why the, the, the Christian and Yazidi uh, IDPs, internally displaced people, can't go back home is because of the presence of um, Iranian Shia militia in their areas. <clears throat> they're, they're dangerous, they're uh, very unpredictable, they're undisciplined. So the Christians and the Yazidi, uh, that totals close to about a million people, won't go back home, and it's because of the presence of the, the Shia militia. Uh, Baghdad told them to leave, and uh, they retaliated by just closing down all the roads to Mosul and demanding to uh, take control of security. So they only report to Tehran. So that's an important thing to know. The uh, On the borders of Kurdistan, northern Iraq, so we have Iran, uh, which is not a great country. Um, Iraq is uh, kind of unraveling. It's, again, very, very unsteady. And then you have Turkey. And what people need to know about Turkey is um, Erdogan is full on most Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, Turkey is in expansionist mode. They uh, they bomb 45 minutes north of our house, <clears throat> inside northern Iraq, Kurdistan, regularly, almost daily. Uh, they have bases inside Iraq, forward bases, and they they want it back. Uh, what you know what the narrative is is the new Ottoman Empire. 
they they want back what was once there. So Mosul was an Ottoman capital. They want it back, um, and they have been they're they're nearby, and uh, uh, the pieces are coming together now again for them to um, uh, continue with their expansion. So Turkey is the new caliphate. Um, it's it's not at all correct or accurate to say that ISIS is a hundred percent destroyed. We've heard that it's not true at all. They're still around, but they are scattered. Not they're not a standing army. They're in an insurrection. But uh, the new caliphate for the radical Sunni there is uh, Turkey. And again, Turkey wants to restore the Ottoman Empire, and they want to grab land and territory. So that's uh, that's an important thing for people to know. It's weird because we always think of politics, except in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when we had a Cold War, as you're dealing with other people who are nice, that they, that, you know, that they aren't enemies, that there's no evil in the world. And I think, you know, President Trump's mistake is to think by pulling out, he's just going to ask people to be nice and don't hurt anybody. You know, you can you can take the property you want and the, the land you want, but be nice about it. We can all be men in this. And that's not how the world works. That's that's a, a, a deceiving uh, look at the world today. Yeah, I mean, the American narrative where we get in trouble is sort of, you know, we draw back on, you know, World War II. It's sort of good and bad. Mm-hmm. You know, U.S. And, the, and, you know, our European allies, good, Hitler, bad. You know, the U.S., good, Japan, bad. Uh, that's that's how our that's how the dynamic works for us. There's good and bad. Um, that's not the case in the real world. You can have uh, bad and worse. You know, you can have sometimes good <laughs> and sometimes bad. <laughs> and these and, and and those categories move around. They they shift. Uh, you know, based on alliances and they shift based on issues. So you know, that's that's the thing the U.S. Americans I think struggle with is to have a situation where we can have, you know, bad and bad. <laughs> okay. And I try to navigate that. So let's play uh, Christianity on the ground now, uh, and I'm going back with information probably three weeks old. Uh, a lot has mm-hmm. happened in three weeks. Mm-hmm. Up till three weeks ago, the fastest growing Christian country on the planet Earth was Iran. Probably, that's probably after that was China. Uh, after China, some other Asian countries. Uh, I don't know if that's still happening. I don't know if the, the, the politics of the day is going to disrupt the growth of the, the Christian church in Iran. Well, actually, the, I mean, uh, Iran is, is sort of self-contained right now, okay. um, and they're, they're doing what they do. The one thing we know, though, is that the kingdom expands under uh, crisis and persecution. So, you know, what we'll see here, and I believe, is an opportunity uh, with the Syrian refugees. There are, uh, I mean, we're seeing the biggest move of God in history in the Islamic world right now, where there is more uh, instability and persecution. We've seen more openness to the kingdom. Um, you know, we don't ask for it, but we, we work with it. And so, uh, see the, wherever there are Syrian refugees, they are, they are really open to the gospel. Kurds are very, very open right now. And so, you know, we have a, a quarter million almost Syrian Kurdish refugees on the ground in northern Iraq uh, who have been there for five years. They were beginning to go home until eight days ago. But when the U.S. pulled back, uh, that changed everything. Now we've been, the latest numbers are in the past, I guess, eight days, there's 270,000 newly displaced civilians. And we expect the majority of them to be coming to us in northern Iraq. So they're, the Kurds in the UN are opening new refugee camps. But you know what we'll see is an opportunity to uh, receive and, and uh, show them the love of Christ and the gospel when they get there. Now what the average viewer probably doesn't know is all around the Middle East there's tent cities set up by the UN where refugees are housed. And they've been there for a long time. They've been displaced for about how long now? Five years, since August of uh, 14. Okay. We are now back in August of 14. We, we, we've wiped out the last five years of advancements, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, we were, up until eight days ago, we were really, uh, we've had two years of, of stability, and we were beginning to turn the corner from uh, relief to recovery. It's been a very slow road, but we've been getting beginning to see signs of new normal 
and recovery in the camps. We still have about 1.1 million uh, refugees, IDPs from ISIS uh, up in our area of northern Iraq. Uh, the conditions are, are very difficult for them, but we were we were seeing some hope, seeing some initiative. We've had stability, and now um, we're back. It looks just exactly we're gearing up for 2014 again. So a wave of a quarter million refugees coming our way. Uh, they'll have trauma. There will be casualties because it's a, a war zone. Um, they'll be very uh, frail when they, they get to us. Uh, the numbers are uh, 70,000 of the 270,000 are children. Uh, we're going to need basically what they're telling us on the ground right now is uh, you know, milk, diapers, mattresses, blankets, food. Um, the UN gives uh, one blanket, one mattress per family. Average family size is seven. Uh, it's winter is coming. It will get below freezing. So we have to look for the gaps. And historically, one of the gaps that we've been able to fill in uh, by God's grace are blankets and mattresses. So this is what it looks like early days going back to when ISIS came. The average viewer is not being asked to run out to Walmart and buy a blanket and buy a mattress. There's better ways to get resources to uh, these affected areas. Uh, can you help me out with that, Father? Yeah, relief is relief is not complicated. You know, it's, okay. it's what do people need? Uh, can you where do you get it from, and how do you get it to them? Uh, so what we found out in August of 14 was uh, everything we needed uh, for the refugee crash. There's two million coming across the border all at once. Uh, w was available sourced locally. We could we could find everything. That's good news. We didn't have to ship in containers and and wait. Um, our our gap was um, uh, trucks. So we had our church partners, uh, Christ Church Midland, provided the first relief truck, and uh, it's still going. So uh, you know that's how we connect the dots there. So we're, uh, we can, we can, it's very, very expensive to ship things to us. Uh, over there, we can get a blanket and mattress in the market for a good set for about $20. Uh, we can find everything we need. Generally, $30 to $40 provides a month's worth of food. We put the food kits together for them with our ground team. So um, basically, with us, is 100% of what comes in for relief uh, is uh, immediately turned into uh, blankets, mattresses, diapers, milk, food on the ground there. We go shopping every day, get them in the trucks, and get them out to where the uh, the refugees are, are coming. Is there a website they could go to that might help them with that type of information? Yeah, thanks. So it's <laughs> www. Yes, working it for five years. Yes. Uh, Loveforthelease.org. So loveforthelease.org, you can put... Uh, refugees in the memo line of a check or in the notes section of a online secure credit card gift and again 100 percent just we're uh, we either wire it over um, or if I'm on the ground I can go to the ATM machine and uh, just pull it out there and we go straight to the store so we have no paid staff on our side uh, it just 100 percent goes to buying the things we need to get to the people and then we work, we've always worked with local partners. You know, our take on relief is find the good locals and uh, resource them. Wait, watch, learn who the good players on the ground are, and, uh, and then just uh, resource the heck out of them. And so we have a great uh, Christian Kurdish nonprofit uh, that's been around for a good while, and they've been our partners since the ISIS days, and they're, they're just phenomenal. So, uh, you know, we get behind them and support them in their local work because they know the people, they know the community. And also what we've learned is that smaller groups do better in crisis because their crisis is very dynamic. And what we found are the bigger organizations tend to be, uh, they're like moving a, an aircraft carrier. Uh, uh, people's needs change in the recovery cycle. They're continuously changing. So we find smaller and nimble is uh, better for getting a read on where the people are at that moment and getting them what they actually need. I mean, it's interesting you say that because there was a huge hurricane over in Puerto Rico and the answer by the U.S. government was to send billions of dollars and poof, just disappears. Yeah, and well, we, we, saw that in we saw that in Hurricane Katrina days. I mean, Katrina was, you know, as well. The, the, 
the God love the Red Cross, but the president of the Red Cross was fired over, you know, their Katrina response. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our experience on the ground was just, uh, you know, this, the, the, the smaller ones uh, were, were really good stewards of money and they knew how to get it to the people and there wasn't a whole lot of overhead. So that's kind of our take is to, uh, that's why we first went to Iraq in 2014, three weeks after ISIS declared the caliphate, was to accurately um, uh, assess and share what was really going on the ground and then find credible, reliable ground partners locally that, uh, cause there were people who wanted to help, but they didn't know how. And so what we do is link up, uh, compassionate people in the West with the people on the front lines and get out of the way. And, uh, so our partners there have been activated. They're already setting up their, uh, working the, uh, one uh, new camp for the Syrians is already being built. Uh, and they're there on the ground right now providing food for the first wave uh, as we speak. It's happening right now, and then I'm hoping to get over uh, into Syria next week and working on those logistics right now. Okay, I want to thank you for your time, but before we go any further, uh, explain to people why it's important to keep your identity uh, hidden. Um, I'm on a, a first-name basis with the secret police in several countries, so it's best not to... Um, uh, antagonize them. That's right. <laughs> well, I, I, somebody said, are you having blah, blah, blah on again? Said he's not blah, blah, blah. He's Father Argo. Thank We're going to keep his identity secret because your mission must continue. And uh, I think that uh, people sometimes think it's a joke, joke, ha, ha, that we cover your face. No, it's real. You know, oh, no. And, um, you know, we just had a, a pastor in the Islamic Republic where we were and still are very connected. Uh, was just pulled in by the police for three weeks with no charges against him, nothing. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, and I'm, I'm expendable. Uh, what our, our ultimate concern is we don't want to burn the locals. You know, yeah. I, you know I can hopefully get kicked out of the country. Um, you know, they can't. And so tracing me back to, to local people with whom we work, that's the ultimate concern is to protect the nationals. Uh, so that's why we're, we're particularly careful. I want to thank you again for your time. Uh, one, we did a, a show when you were over there once, and I hope we can do that again uh, from the camps and uh, give people a feel for what's really happening and, and what happens when there's a vacuum. And we need to, yeah, I mean, to it's possible that in 10 days we could do a live stream from uh, sure. or record something from inside Syria, which is where I'm hoping to uh, get to right now. I hope you've enjoyed this special episode of Anglican Unscripted with Father Argo and Kevin Coulson. <laughs>